Hey, this is Gabriel. Welcome to the fifth part of the Robot Components Beginner Series. In this video, we'll explore different movement types and how to visualize them inside of Rhino. We'll start off with the IRB 1205 component that we've also used in the last part of this course. Next, we want to pick the Move component from the Code Generation category. It comes with four inputs that we'll go through step by step. The first one takes in a target parameter. In Robot Components, there are two different ways to create a target. In the last part of this video, we've already worked with one of them, the Rob Target component. The second one is found right next to it. It's the Join Target. We'll have a look at that one more closely in a second. For now, let's continue with the other inputs of the Move component. The second one takes in a speed data parameter. We can create our own speed data by using the speed data component from the code generation category. However, Robot Components comes with a set of ready to use speed datas, which are the same that are predefined by ABB. If we do a right click on the movement component and click on the documentation entry, we can take a closer look on how to access them. As you can see, under the input parameter description, we can simply choose from a list of numeric values that we can plug into the speed data input. Each of them resembles the velocity with which the robot approaches its targets in millimeters per second. Let's close the documentation and create a panel. I'll go with a value of 100 and plug it into the speed data label. The next input will define the movement type we are going to choose for our movement. We can see that there are three of them available. An absolute joint movement, a linear movement and the joint movement. We can plug in a value between 0 and 2 to choose which one we want to use. We'll take a closer look at each of them later in this video. For now, let's move on to the last input. This one is the zone data. It defines the precision of our robot movement. Like with the speed data, we could create a custom zone data by using the according component from the code generation tab. However, since this is an advanced topic, for now we'll again simply go with a preset value. Let us open the documentation again and see which values are valid. As we can see, using a value of minus 1 resembles the most precise zone data, which is interpreted as fine movement. Let's close the documentation. Since we try to design robot components as intuitive as possible, instead of using the numeric value of minus 1 for the fine movement, we can also simply use a panel and type in fine. Now that we've looked at all the different inputs for the move component, let's go on by creating a target. Since we already used the rob target in the last part of the series, let's create a join target this time. The join target inputs are similar to the ones of the forward kinematics. We can use it right out of the box, since robot components will automatically create a default joint position for the target under the hood, which sets all its axis values to zero. Let us place an inverse kinematics component on the canvas to visualize the position of the robot. I'll plug the IRB1205 into the robot and the join target into the movement input. Let us also deactivate the preview for our robot component. As you can see, nothing has seemed to change. That's because the robot joint position parameter of our join target is defined by default with zero degrees of rotation for each axis. That's the exact same values with which our IRB1205 preset and all other robot definitions are visualized in Rhino out of the box. However, in case of our join target, we can easily change the axis values by creating a robot joint position component. We have already used this one when we were exploring the forward kinematics component. Let's plug it into the input of our join target and connect a slider to each of the robot axis values. We can now dynamically adjust our join target. Let's connect it to the move component. As you can see, Robot Components automatically creates a drop-down menu for us that is already plugged into the movement type input of the move component. So, instead of choosing a numeric value between 0 and 2, we can simply choose the movement type through the menu. Note that a joint target can only be used with an absolute joint movement. For now, let's replace the joint target for the inverse kinematics movement input with the actual movement. Nothing changed. 
This is because, as stated before, the inverse kinematics component will automatically creating an absolute joint movement from any target connected to it. So practically, there is no difference in connecting the joint target or the movement to it. Now that we have defined our first movement, let's create a second one. I will create an XY plane as target plane and connect a point parameter to it so we can dynamically move it around inside of Rhino. I will take it somewhere more closely to the robot tool plane. Notice that the robot target component is still giving us a warning. Let's see what's going on. It tells us that the target name is already in use. This is because any new joint or robot target will be named default target. So since we have already constructed joint target, this name is taken. Let us rename our robot target to target2 and our joint target to target1. In general, you can name a target to whatever you like to. However, there are some rules that need to be followed. We can have a look at the documentation for that. As we can see, apart from being unique, the target name may not contain any special characters or start with a number. This is also true for any other kind of naming in robot components. Let's get back into Grasshopper. Now that we have successfully created the second target, let's also create another movement. I will connect the robot target to it and use the same speed data and zone data values as for the first movement. When all other inputs are connected, the movement type drop down menu will be generated automatically again. We'll get into the different movement types a little bit later. Before, I want to make sure that our second target is set up correctly. So let's plug the movement into our inverse kinematics. As you can see, we have the same problem as in the last part of the series. The plane is facing the wrong direction. So we'll be making use of the flip plane Y component. Now that this problem is fixed, let's get back to the movement type selection. By default, the movement type is said to be an absolute joint movement. However, even though linear and joint movements are valid when using a ROP target, we still won't see any difference in our inverse kinematics preview when changing those values. That's because the IK component is not able to visualize the movement itself. You might be asking yourself at this point, why does the IK component use a movement input and not a target input if it makes no difference? And that's a pretty good question. It's due to the nature of movements when working with rapid code. A move declaration can also have a work object connected to it, which defines the coordinate space the target will be located in. By default, the work object coordinate space will be the same as the word coordinate space. However, if we do a right click on the movement component, we can add additional inputs. If we would select the override work object entry, we would be able to connect a custom work object to our movement that will map our robot target to a different coordinate space. And thus, we would definitely see a difference in our IK visualization when using the movement instead of the target. We'll find the work object component under the definition category. However, since work objects are a more advanced topic, we won't get deeper into this here. Now, let's move on to finally visualize our movements. Since the IK component is not helping us here, robot components comes with a separate component for this task, the path generator. We can find it under the simulation tab like the IK. At first, this component might look a little bit overwhelming, but it isn't really that complicated. As with all simulation components, the first input takes in our robot definition. So we can directly plug it in. The second input will take in a list of actions. Actions are basically all components you can find under the code generation category. However, the path generator will ignore everything except for movements. This also means that it won't react to the auto access configurator component which lets the ABB controller decide on its own what's the best solution in approaching a target. Instead, the path generator will always use the grasshopper access configuration value of each target for its simulation. Another thing to keep in mind is even though the path generator is often very accurate, it can only approximate the robot movement path. There is no guarantee the simulation is 100% valid. It is only meant to be used as a quick previewing system. Now that we got that out of the way, let's connect our movements to it. Therefore, we need to use Grasshopper's merge component. Here, we need to take care of the correct order for our robot movement instructions. I will set the absolute joint movement as first data entry and the linear movement as second data entry. 
The result will be an ordered list of connected actions. Let's connect it to the action input of the path generator. As you can see, we'll immediately get a preview of the robot movement path in the Rhino viewport. Let us turn off the preview for the inverse kinematic so we have a less confusing sight. We can connect a numeric slider to the animation input to visualize the actual movement. Note that the input always needs to be a value between 0 and 1. If we now move the slider, we can see the robot moving along the path. However, it only moves one step at a time and the movement doesn't look very smooth. This is because the path generator is interpolating all the positions between the two targets. To get a more smooth transition, we can increase the interpolation value. By default, the set to 5. Let's increase it to 20. The animation is now much smoother. However, notice that this heavily impacts performance. It's fine when working with a fairly short movement path, however, you want to turn this value down when working with a more complex list of actions. Before we finally move on to the different movement types, let's discuss the last input of the path generator. By default, it will be set to true. This means that the path generator will be constantly updating the path when doing any changes to the list of actions. So, you might ask yourself why this should ever be set to false. That's because with increasing complexity of the action list, the path generator will have a hard time calculating all the movement paths which can heavily impact performance. So often, you'll find yourself in a situation where you only want the path generator to recalculate when you have made multiple changes to the action list. In fact, I would encourage you to always connect a button to the update input. This way, you can be sure that the path generator will only be recalculating the action list if you really want it. Now, let's finally go back to our movement component and have a look at the three different movement types. At the moment, our second movement is said to be a linear movement, which is used to move the TCP linearly to a given destination. We can clearly observe this in the Rhino viewport. It's a red line generated by the path generator. To visualize the difference between linear and joint movements, we can simply change the movement type of our ROB target to an absolute joint movement and update the path generator. As you can see, the path changes to a curve instead of a straight line. That's because a joint movement is interpolating between axis values rather than between two planes. If we change the movement type of our ROB target again to be a joint movement instead of an absolute joint movement and update the path generator one more time, we won't see any difference since they are calculated similar in this situation. However, there is a difference between them. While absolute joint movements are only working with joint targets and thus absolute axis values, they can't have different axis configuration. This means they do not work with the outer axis configurator or work objects since they are using absolute joint values instead of coordinates and orientation. You might be wondering why we can use them with ROB targets then. That's because the movement component will convert them to absolute joint targets under the hood. Regular joint movements work quite differently. They come with some advantages. They can be also used with the auto axis configuration of the ABB controller and can be mapped to different coordinate spaces when being used with work objects. That's because joint movements are working with robot targets and thus coordinates and orientation. So, to conclude, let's summarize all of this again. Linear movements are used to move the TCP straight to a given destination. Joint movements are used to move the robot quickly from one point to another when the movement doesn't have to be a straight line. Both of them can have different axis configurations and are usable with the auto axis configurator and work objects. They are only valid for ROB targets though. Absolute joint movements are used to move the robot to an absolute position defined as joint position. Thus, they can't be used with the auto axis configurator or work objects and are defined by a specific robot axis configuration. When using a ROB target for an absolute joint movement, it will be internally converted. Before we finish this video, one more thing. You might be wondering why we can't see a path for the first movement but only for the second one. That's because a path always consists of two targets, a start and an end target. However, we do not know the target for the first movement path since this is defined by the real robot's position. So for the first path, there is no start target but only an end target from the first movement. This also implies the following rule. The first movement always needs to be set to an absolute joint position. 
That's because an absolute joint movement doesn't need to know the initial position of the robot. Whatever the axis values might be, they will be interpolated to the new joint position and are not dependent on a specific coordinate space or axis configuration. That's it for now, thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video where we'll explore how to set up a custom robot tool from scratch.